The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Welcome. Today we have a terrific artist, a great master, Albert Handel. And this one is all about the problem that every artist has, how to make good-looking greens. This is a new video, a new release called Painting Greens in Oil. Enjoy. I'm Albert Handel, and uh, welcome to my video. In this video, I will show you how I mix together a transparent underpainting, finishing with uh, opaque oils and having them both come through. I tell my students when somebody's going into, my, or into oils, I say, you know, the nice thing about oils is that they're wet, the problem with oils is that they're wet. And I'm going to show you how you can make use of that fact rather than uh, be shot down because of it. And I mean that. Um, uh, if you get going with the wet too soon, you're going to be slipping all over the place like I used to at one time. The textual quality of opaque paint in relationship to transparent paint is a, a textual quality that only will exist if you, if you do that, so to speak. Uh, can't be a mono application uh, with uh, thick oils and then some blending or something, I mean. Um, no, this is going to be very interesting. I try and cover my canvas at the beginning, thinking of warm and cool, nothing else. And I show that. I take ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. It's, it's interesting. I have found that if I complement uh, my greens uh, with a little bit of uh, burnt sienna, you know, if they're dark green, it, it, it um, makes the greens fuller. It's strange, a little less is more. Uh, without doing these little, I call them 10 percenters. When I'm teaching that, because the people can get, can put too much, burnt sienna into the green and it's not green anymore it's burnt sienna you don't want that you want it to be green and you don't want it to be a boring green you just want a little i call it a zets a touch a hit uh there's leaves now when i have contrast um this is darker and this is lighter and they take shapes and all that rather than noodle them and weaken them, I put something else on top of them. And that's something I've come up with over the years and I've never heard it anywhere else before. And what I do is I go out of uh, uh, value, so to speak. In other words, when I want to get some green leaves floating over all this, I will go to a, a, a richer green and then by uh, uh, varying, the uh, varying the pressure. Uh, and when I have these leaves, and you'll see this, I look at them as a rhythm. What does that mean? Uh, right here you're going to see some green leaves. Okay, good. 
What about them? The, the green leaves, as if they're, they're, they're a thing on themselves. Oh, well, they go up to the right and they get lost. Fine. I'll go to a, 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 a darker green or a colder green and keep going as if the green uh, is an entity in itself. I call them rhythms or movements. And uh, they tie together contrasting areas without weakening the contrasting areas. See? Uh, I get very excited about these things. And uh, it's going to be a pleasure showing you this. Now, when I lay out my colors, white always goes there. Uh, ultramarine blue always goes there. It's a little bit like the piano. C-sharp goes where C-sharp is. You don't have C-sharp all over the place. So it's good to figure out your palette. Now you can take something off the palette. You can put something else on the palette. But basically, orange goes where cadmium orange goes. When I was younger, I would never buy a pre-mixed color. I'd always be having the extremes, cadmium yellow light, cadmium orange, cadmium red light, uh, all this and all that. And uh, I found there was an awful lot of mixing, an awful lot of mixing. And I have found uh, by uh, getting a few pre-mixed colors, which I could mix myself, but I, I bought them, and by laying them out, I can move in and out of the half tones very easily and very beautifully, especially since I am painting, you could say with two palettes if you wish, I'm painting transparently and I'm painting opaquely and I'm mixing them together. So um, this color here is violet gray. It's a gorgeous color. My greens, my lightest green <laughs> is this one. <laughs> and uh, for my blues, I have ultramarine blue and I have this Rembrandt. Most of my colors, uh, when I started out, were all Winsor Newton. And now they're a variety of things. But uh, if there was one color that stood out from all the Winsor Newtons, it was Serves Blue by Rembrandt. Um, there might be some other colors that come close to it or all that and this. But um, now, monochrome tint warm is this lovely gentle color right here and then this is a rose gray and i can't tell you how simple i can just <laughs> move them backwards and forwards Okay, let's talk about those um, greens in summer. And uh, let's start off with um, Viridian. Viridian is a mineral. It's a dark green. And when I put white into Viridian, The viridian looks like a, a gray green of some sort. 
and it's on the cool side. And I'm going to make a a marker too, right here. So that's my viridian with some white. But what I like about viridian is that I can control the, the greens from a cool gray green. Go back to the viridian and take cadmium yellow light and put it in the viridian. And I have a very warm green. And to make it lighter, I just add some more cadmium yellow light into it. And I put it right next to this. If you squint your eyes, there'll be practically no edge. Maybe I'm just a tad darker. So here is a warm and a cool green. And I'll just put that right over here. <clears throat> now what I have done with my greens is I uh, put a little uh, camsole on it and I dry it off. So I can just get the viscosity to flow a little bit. And here, let me show you this so you don't think I'm doing something strange. There it is, right? Full, full blast. Now what I do a lot, full blast, that means it's gonna stay wet. This is gonna dry if it's not already dry. So, uh, that's how I start my underpainting, except instead of using green, I use anything but green. And uh, let me show you that. I'll clean my brush. And if you find you have some paint somewhere, you better get it going. I told you I used ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. So let's, um, let's do that. Let's take it by brush. Ultramarine blue. When I mix the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna, I get a very dark color. It's, it's another way of making black, though black is just a touch blacker. Now, if I put white into that, I can see what this is all about. So I'll take the white, and I'm gonna take this brush and I'm going to put some white into it. Now you can hardly see this. That means it's the same value as the palette. The palette has a little bit of gray to it. So I'm gonna just keep mixing it. And you have a wonderful bunch of grays. I'll make a mark here. Look at that. A beautiful gray. 
uh, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna put it on like that, and then I'm gonna take it and scrub it on. Uh, scrubbing on means it dries quickly. Putting it on means it doesn't dry quickly. Now, I have, I'm gonna take a little bit more ultramarine blue and put it into this mixture. Then I'm gonna take some white and you're gonna see how cold it is. Uh, now I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna do this also. A lot of people don't realize uh, what could happen when they scrub, uh, scrub things on. Now I'm gonna take the burnt sienna and I'm gonna put more of that into this and put some white into it. And you're gonna see how red it is. And I'll do this. So this is new too, that's cool. I'm gonna make the cool gray, a little cooler by just adding more blue into it. And uh, again, some white. Then let's see what that looks like. That's a little bluer. Just by Mixing these two colors together, I can get a range uh, all the way from ultramarine blue all the way. So I put uh, nothing in there except ultramarine blue, and now I want to do that with this. So I can go all the way from here to there by mixing them together and bringing up the value. So this means uh, I can do a lot of things with it. I can get very dark with it. Now there's a few ways to get very dark. One of them is um, viridian, alizarin crimson, and stuff like that. I, I find, um, uh, the alizarin is a bit of a problem. I, I'd rather just, uh, I'm gonna make it very dark. Same, same story. And on this, it's gonna look very, very dark. It's gonna look like it's black. Let's see what all these colors would look like on a gray background. Let's start over again, so to speak. A gray background, I'm gonna take the same thing that looked like black. And what I'm going to do is put some extra blue into the mixture, okay? And it all looks like black. Now I'm gonna take white. I'm gonna get that mixture. 
And then I'm going to take some burnt sienna. Put it right into this. And then I'm going to take some white. And I'm just going to take some white. And that will give you a, a bit of an idea of... Um, how warm, how warm and how cool that mixture can be. And they are both slow colors. What's meant by a slow color in my terminology? Alizarin crimson, you take a little alizarin crimson, you put it into white, you don't have white anymore. It's a fast color, it's like a dye. Uh, these two colors, well, burnt sienna is like an earth color and ultramarine blue is a... Um, Ultramarine blue is ultramarine blue, <laughs> but uh, burnt sienna is uh, burnt sienna, raw sienna. What do you think it comes from? Sienna, uh, umber, umbrio. Let's do that green thing again. Taking viridian and putting some white into it. So you've seen. Um, what these colors look like on a white background. This you can hardly see because it's up in value. It's close in value. Now I'm going to um, do this again with this here yellow and viridian. And it's going to be very verdant as compared to just the white. And let's see what this looks like. Oh, you can't see it too much. I'll make it brighter. So I can control Viridian with white, with Naples yellow. And where do you think Naples yellow comes from? That's right, Naples. Okay, I'm going to start this oil um, using um, Gamsol as my medium, and I'm going to draw with a brush. Drawing with a brush means I'm not worried about uh, color at all. I usually work with a brown or a dark gray. Uh, right now, it's um, I believe it's Van Dyke brown, and um, uh, this is going to be the ground plane. Uh, and this is going to be upright trees. And um, when I uh, work with uh, drawing with a brush, I draw lightly, uh, basically uh, so I can make adjustments. As soon as I get uh, heavier, um, uh, it's harder to make uh, adjustments. And when I get to here, I realize how much higher this is from here. And then um, uh, another very important line is this. And it means that from here to here, there's a small amount of space. And from here to here, there's a large amount of space. And um, when I get down here, I um, scrub this on. Um, and I realize um, there's going to be a tie-up uh, between uh, um, these two group of uh, trees. And um, so these lines are very important compositionally. Uh, I always like to hold um, a rag or something in my left hand. Uh, it's a habit, and I'm able to uh, um, dip the brush into Gamsol and kind of wipe it down and feel the flexibility of it. And um, I'm uh, working on it. Uh, rather dry. Uh, uh, it's not soaking wet at all. And um, uh, I look at everything above this line as upright. Uh, the trees are upright. And I come up to here 
And uh, uh, this, this line, um, I'm going to keep it uh, flexible, so to speak. Now, I like to work from dark to light. And um, what I do with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. If I want it colder, I just add a little bit more blue into it. And let's see what this feels like. That looks like it's nice and cool, uh, cold in color. And uh, uh, I'll put some more burnt sienna in this, and you'll see how this is warmer in color. OK. So I'll take a larger brush. And uh, uh, more or less do the same thing. Uh, I don't want it too wet. I just want it wet enough so that I can, you know, the paint comes right out of the tube. And, uh, I, okay, let's see what this feels like. Now, uh, in order for this to cover and dry quickly, I actually spread the paint out. Now here it's kind of warm. I'm going to cool it off so you can see. Um, I'm going to go right into ultramarine blue, and the brush is dirty. So yeah, here we go. So um, in this whole area, uh, there's going to be a lot of th things happening. But right now, for the composition, we have that. And it's kind of cold and kind of warm. I'm going to keep it uh, colder at the base. And uh, that means more blue. And I'll go like this. And um, like I say, I'll, I'll clean the brush off on the surface. What I want to do is kind of cover it and have it dry quickly so I can paint over it. And thusly, um, I use uh, the Gamsol as my medium. And um, I'm always um, feeling things with the brush and all that. Here it's very cool. And um, there's going to be a lot of green in this uh, painting, uh, summer greens. And for the background, I will um, uh, use anything but green. And. Um, as far as um, where should it be cool, where should it be warm, for the moment, um, let's go by feel and not worry about that. All I can say is uh, look how warm that is. And it's a little wet, and I want it drier. And uh, I'll go like this. So um, you can spread the paint out quite a bit. If you could just keep in the back of the mind, uh, clean your brush off at the beginning uh, on your surface. It will get transparent and uh, dry quickly. That's what I'm trying to do right now. And if it's a little warmer, a little colder, uh, that's a secondary thought. I like to do that so I can get a little variety in things. So, uh, there we go. Now, um, at the base here, there's going to be a crossover. And I think I'll keep it cooler. I'm not too sure why. Just, uh, you know, some, some things you just feel. And we go like that. And then there's going to be a crossover here. And in this crossover, 
I want you to know it's lower here and it's higher here. And um, I'll, I'll keep it uh, on the cool side, which means bluish. And um, I'll just uh, scrape it on. Now, as I do this, I'm aware that this shape is small and this shape is large. Um, all right. And there's going to be a lot of crossing over. Now, underneath here, there's going to be a, a lighter green. And um, I'm going to, uh, I have uh, uh, two of these. Uh, this is for diluting the paint, and this will be for cleaning my brushes. And um, I'm going to take um, this green, and you'll know exactly what that is. And I'm just going to go like this. And um, I look at this green. Uh, oh, if I took it right out of the tube, it's like that. Now, if I work on this right out of the tube, uh, it ain't going to dry. This is going to dry. Look, I just put it on. Uh, look, look. See, that's what I want to do. Uh, what I tell my students you know, I teach pastel and I teach oils and there are some folks who are crossing over from one medium to the other. And I say to them, the nice thing about oils is that they're wet. The problem with oils is that they're wet. So I want my oils to be wet at the right time, not the wrong time. Now, uh, the underpainting has soft edges to it, and when I get to the edge, I, uh, like a naughty little boy, I, I go over the, the fence, so to speak. You know, I tie it together. Think of it like that, um, that it's swimming. Now, this is pretty cold. And um, uh, I'm going to warm it up just a tad uh, with a different green. We'll see how much it shows. I actually like to work from dark to light. I'm going to go right back to what I just had. And um, uh, I'd like to work from cool to warm. Uh, so this um, lighter green is on the, on the cool side, okay? Um, here's that color without any of the warmth in it. Now, here, I'm going to just put a pile of it on, okay? So this color here... is nice and dark. And when I thin it out, uh, and I'm going to do that right now, um, so it's not too wet, I'm going to take this amount of paint and just clean my, just get rid of the white, get one step closer to where I'm going to end up, And as I get up here, I want you to say, the heck with the edge. Just no edge. So the rule of thumb, in my opinion, is in the underpainting, very little edges, and as transparent as you can, dry. In other words, don't uh, put in a lot of uh, gamsol or anything like that. You want to clean the brush off on the surface so that, look, I don't know how long I've been painting, 10 minutes, but look, okay. Now, as far as the sky goes, this has uh, some gloss to it. This is very matte. And um, what I'm going to do is um, 
kind of wet it down or something. I don't know. He's not, I just want to get rid of the matness. And uh, that's a little bit dirty. I, uh, I just want to literally wet it down without using anything. Just see, see the difference between that and this? Okay. The next thing I want to do is um, uh, start establishing a few trees. Uh, I'm not too sure what the color is. So, and I know they're dark. So I go back to uh, my Van Dyke Brown. Um, this is uh, my drawing color, if you wish. I do that. I say, all right. Uh, not worrying about the color at all. It's just darker, period. And it might be a little fatter. And um, I do that and I say, well, um, the whole thing will be like that, but let's see, let's just leave it alone for a moment. And um, I'm going to have a very thin one near it. Something like that. So when I look at all of this, from here to here is close to the same. Here is getting small, and here it's longer. Um, okay. And I'll come down to here, approximately there. And I'll come down to here and maybe even come a little further. And um, I'm just feeling my way around. So when I feel my way around, I don't worry about the color. I uh, go back to uh, drawing with a brush. And in this instance, it's a, it's, it's a brown. And um, there might be something else going on here and all that. Now I'll come down to the base and I'll keep using my, my drawing color and I'll scrub it on again. Now this is a Van Dyke brown and this is the second um, layer that I'm scrubbing on. And um, at this point, uh, I could sh put a little bit of a dark green into that. Um, uh, just, here's the green, okay? Now, um, I'm going to clean the brush. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to just do that. And I'll get a little blue into that. Okie dokie. Now, as I get down towards the base, I'll go right back to the Van Dyke Brown. And this time I'll put in some uh, uh, burnt sienna, which will make it very red. And I'll just put it in. And uh, right now, this probably all looks quite dark rather than warm, cool, uh, gray, uh, all that. But later, you will see what, uh, what all this is about. Okay, I come up to here. And um, I want to put a sky hole in. Uh, let me talk about that for a second. There's something called lifting, which uh, I make a lot of use of, especially at the beginning. Uh, rather than um, put some paint on to get some sky here, I'd rather lift this and it'll look something like that. It's basically taking uh, a, a slightly stiffer brush, a short hair, and uh, take your time. 
There's no rush. And uh, I like that. And I want to lift, I want a sky hole there. And, uh, oh, uh, now when I come down to here, uh, I mentally say, um, uh, this is uh, longer and this is shorter. And uh, uh, I, I, just me I just do that. In other words, when I'm down here, I say the other side of it, is it higher, lower, the same, what? The, these sky holes, which is done by lifting, and uh, it shows beautifully at the beginning of the painting, and uh, you can do this later on, but I'm showing it to you now so you can really see uh, how I can cut into this, and uh, I might want to do this. And a lot of this is done by feel. I'm Albert Handel, and welcome to my video. In this video, I will show you how I mix together a transparent underpainting, finishing with uh, opaque oils, and having them both come through. You know, the nice thing about oils is that they're wet. The problem with oils is that they're wet. And I'm going to show you how you can make use of that fact rather than uh, be shot down because of it. No, this is going to be very interesting. I try and cover my canvas at the beginning thinking of warm and cool, nothing else. And I show that. I take ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. It's, it's interesting. I have found that if I complement uh, my greens uh, with a little bit of, of burnt sienna, you know, if they're dark, it, it, it uh, makes the greens fuller. It's strange. A little less is more. You just want a little, I call it a zets, a touch, a hit. Uh, there's leaves. Now, when I have contrast, um, this is darker and this is lighter, and they take shapes and all that, rather than noodle them and weaken them, I put something else on top of them. And that's something I've come up with over the years and I've never heard it anywhere else before. When I want to get some green leaves floating over all this, I will go to a, a, a richer green and then by uh, varying the pressure, I look at them as a rhythm. What does that mean? Uh, right here you're going to see some green leaves. Okay, good. What about them? Oh, well they go up to the right and they get lost. Fine, I'll go to a darker green or a colder green and keep going as if the green uh, is an entity in itself. Uh, I call them rhythms or movements. And uh, they tie together contrasting areas without weakening the contrasty areas. See? Uh, I get very excited about these things. And uh, it's going to be a pleasure showing you this. Well, that was Albert Handel, and the video is called Painting Greens in Oil. And you can learn more about that video at streamline.art. Remember, today only we have a discount on this new release, and you can find that discount code in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with Albert. 
1950, in 1957, I was 20, and I went to the Art Students League. Back then in New York City, realism was dead. Um, it was uh, abstract expressionism. Um, if you worked realistically, the intelligentsia would say, well, don't you know it's been done already? Hey. Uh, at the Art Students League, the realists, we were in two categories. One, you work from life and you're a fine artist. Other one, you work from photographs and you're an illustrator. So at 20 years old, I swallowed this. God forbid I should work from a photograph. Um, that notion, which was prevalent back then, uh, is absurd. Uh, so many beautiful works can be done from photography, it's not even funny, especially landscapes. But uh, that's what I grew up on, that's what the Art Students League was like. And um, for 18 or 20 years, I would never use a photograph. And back then, uh, I was doing uh, a lot of indoor work, uh, nudes, portraits, and stuff like that. Never used a photograph. And then when I get tired after three, four months of working indoors, I went outdoors. Um, I had my first car. <laughs> I used to go to Prospect Park. It was designed by the same folks who did Central Park. It was a nice park. And um, I'll never forget this. I always went back at the same time. It was 4 o'clock. I was back there at 4 o'clock or close to 4. And one time I was at Prospect Park, and there were so many things to paint. Uh, but I got involved with such and such. Okay. I said, I'll come back the next day. I came back the next day, a sunny day, nothing. I, 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 if I'm not touched, uh, nothing. So I'm walking back to my car and I say, oh, I think I'll paint my car. <laughs> this is, uh, this is the 19, uh, what am I, 21, 20, this is 1959 or something. Who, what realist who's dealing with lost and found edges is going to paint this car? <laughs> But uh, that's what turned me on. I mean, actually, I did a few paintings of cars uh, using an aesthetic, always lost and found edges, carrying power. Stand back from your pictures and take a look. Carrying power was most important, I guess. I, I'm, and, and whatever detail you got, was to um, uh, complement and fill out the carrying power, never to take over the carrying power. And uh, I was taught from the very beginning to block in the shadow as compared to the light. First thing. Now, outdoors, um, uh, sun, uh, you know, moves, and the shadows are going to change. So uh, take, you have these wonderful cameras now, T take photos. Stop for a second. T take photos every 20 minutes or 30 minutes of, of your subject so you can uh, realize what the experience was. And also... Why don't you take photographs of your painting at the same time? It's such an emotional thing. And, and we forget, and we want more. No matter what we have, we want, we want more. It's like uh, uh, we run right past ourselves sometimes. <laughs> sometimes we have it, and we want more, and we lose what we've had. It would be a good way to analyze your works. I learned this, uh, ironically, I didn't want to do them in the first place. 
My first step-by-steps for the first book uh, I was in, I, I was in, I mean, a number of books, I had to do this step-by-step thing. And, uh, uh, but it was very beneficial. Uh, I, I urge you to remember to photograph your subject, especially if it's sunny, and your your painting, I don't care if it's pastel, oil, uh, I don't know if that's going to help you. But uh, today it's very different. You know, back then you had one magazine, American Artist. Uh, realism was dead. Realism was dead. Not so now. <laughs> Not so now. Now it's alive and well. And... Um, Back at the league, you had Frank J. Riley, who did beautiful work, and they were for Western covers and all that, and and Western art. Look what's happened now with Western art; it's wonderful. But uh, it was considered illustrations, and then you had Frank Mason, who I worked with, who was a student of Frank Vincent Dumont who was a very well-known uh, uh, painting teacher there for, I don't know, 50 years, 60 years. And Mason, I, I, he had just died three years before that, and Mason was his prime, prime student and uh, all this. And um, I wanted to be an illustrator because, you know, fine arts. You know, I'm from Brooklyn, you know. It's... It, it's uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's uh, Jack and Jill, you know, and uh, for me, um, I saw uh, Norman Rockwell and other artists on the covers of Colliers and Post and the illustrations inside, and then when I used to go to a movie theater, they had these marquees uh, that were done by artists, and that was art. That's what I wanted to do, and uh, that was my dream. And uh, when it was my time to come at bat, uh, 10 years later, uh, photography had taken off. <laughs> Norman Rockwell had a period of time where he had no work. Uh, I know that sounds incredible, but uh, it's true. Um, so, uh, I was with my drawing teacher at one time. His name was Louis Priscilla. He died young. He studied with George Bridgman, an anatomist, and I had a secondhand Bridgman education, which was valuable. And we're having some coffee uh, somewhere, and uh, I'm saying to him, uh, he was a cartoonist, I said, you know, um, illustration has changed. And he said, oh yeah. And I said, well, then, you know, I, I want to be an artist. He said, oh, you could be an artist. I said, well, uh, they're not using uh, art anymore in the magazine. He said, yeah, 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 but you could be a fine artist. I said, what's a fine artist? And there were some artists on the table talking to each other about things and arguing with each other. He said, oh, you could be like them. And I looked at them. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, they're fine artists. I said, what's a fine artist? Well, they paint whatever they want, and then they sell it. I said, you paint whatever you want, and then you sell it? Nobody is commissioning it? Nobody is telling you to read a story or something and, and, and come up with something? No, no. So I said, gee, I don't know if that's for me. So, like I say, he was my drawing teacher, and uh, I studied with him on Saturdays. Uh, and one of my uh, fellow students said, uh, come with me to the Village Outdoor Art Show. I said, all right. And there I saw some beautiful still lifes, water scenes. I said, hey, what's going on here? And they said, oh, this is fine art. Well, this I understood. This was beautiful. This was not just blah, blah. 
So I started studying with Rudy Kaleo. God bless him. May his soul rest in peace. I started with Still Lifes, and then I said, uh, who did you study with? He said, Frank Vincent Dumont and uh, Frank Mason. I said, that's it. So I, that was it. That was the art student thing. I, I'll give you another example of how crazy it was. Back then, uh, there, was no, there was no photography. I told you that. God forbid that I took photos. But I, I drew a lot. I had a sketchbook with me at all times. So I'd go down to the village. I'd go down to the Cafe Figaro. And that was the spot. And I'd be drawing. You know, I'm 21, 22, and uh, I'm intense, not bad looking. So uh, one thing leads to another thing, and I'm talking to some nice ladies. And, uh, and uh, NYU is right there. And, um, and they, they want to see what I'm drawing, and I show them, and they say, oh, huh? He says, well, I use these drawings to paint uh, uh, realistic pictures uh, in the studio. And they looked at me and they said, realistic? I said, yeah, realistic. And it was as if I f farted in church or something, you know, as if I did something terribly wrong. Uh, and they'd just shy away, as if I was crazy, to think that way. So that's why I went to Europe. I went to Europe in 1961 to 65. Um, in 67, I'd be 30, okay? So I was 24 to 28 or something. And it was a pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I figured uh, if New York is this nutty, uh, where could it be more sensible? So I thought California, and I heard about all the marijuana and this and that. And I, I said, that must be crazier. So I said, uh, you know, we're in the 50s now, right? It's a different world. And, um, and I was naive and all that. And I, I said to myself, well, look, I like uh, Corot, I, <laughs> I like Delacroix. I'll go, back to, I'll go back to where they come from, and it was France. And I loved it. I loved it. And um, a sketch class there started at 2 o'clock, you know, from 12 to 2, you ate. <laughs> And then at two o'clock, you paid a dollar and you walked into the Grand Chaumier. That's the L'Ecole de Grand Chaumier, the school of the Grand Chaumier. It's on the Rue de Le Grand Chaumier. Uh, Grand Chaumier means uh, uh, whatever it means. It means big, uh, big hunting house. But in any event, you go in there, North Light, and you, you give them 600 francs, which was a dollar or something. And you walk in there, and you're drawing for 45 minutes before they took a break. You know, the art students think it was 20, 25 minutes, five minute break, 10 minute break. This is 45 minutes, 15 minute break. Then it's usually a woman. Then she would take another pose standing or whatever, you know, it was very hard to get the models to stand in New York there. 45 minutes, back view, front view, and you're drawing, and another 15 minute break. Then there's um, a 25 minute pose, this is what I'm used to with a five minute break. And then there's a 15 minute pose and a 10 minute break, uh, 10 minute pose and a break. So it's five o'clock comes in the second model, and there are five-minute poses until seven o'clock. Well, let me tell you, when you get done with that, you are fresh, exhausted, and refreshed. Um, I just love, I, I just love, I just like doing this stuff. I, I, I never thought of anything else. 
Um, I, I did some work at the, at the Louvre. I copied part of uh, Massacre de Sico by uh, Delacroix. I, it's a huge painting. And I did um, one or two of the portraits uh, that's in the lower left-hand side of the thing. And what I did it was in a different medium. Interesting. I wasn't trying to copy every little stroke the man did. I tried to get the essence of it uh, using a Conte crayon, brown, black, white. It was a fascinating experience. I went to Europe because that's, I was interested in the old masters, and that's where the old masters were, in Europe. Uh, I, I, I like, uh, the period I like the most is 1850 to around 1925 or something like that. And John Singer Sargent, uh, Sorolia, um, and and Zorn um, and earlier, and they were uh, respected, and they are part of the culture of Paris, uh, Florence, uh, Venice, and I, I wanted that. I di I didn't want the uh, uh, what does it call it the Eighth Street Bar or something, and talking about uh, the Kooning and company. I mean, God bless them. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. So I went there because I thought it would be more compatible, and I also went there so I could be by myself. I was a bit lonely, yes, but I was by myself, and all those tapes, you should do this, you should do that, they kind of went away. Uh, you should work with a larger brush. I like to work with a smaller brush. Uh, you should work with uh, opaque all the play. I, I like to work transparent and opaque. So I was able to, but uh, it, most of it was studio work. Some of it was outdoors. And uh, I got good. I uh, received uh, grants from uh, the Stacy. Uh, awards, uh, Green Shield Foundation, all that. Uh, you know, I don't know how I did it. Uh, I really don't. Uh, I, n I never had a job, really. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I was asked to teach for 11 weeks in a university uh, when I was uh, 32 or something. And um, but I never had a, I don't know how I did it. I don't come from a wealthy background. My, my parents are immigrants, actually. Uh, my father couldn't understand I wanted to go back to Europe. I mean, he came over uh, third, third grade, third class, um, from the Ukraine or someplace. And uh, he couldn't understand why. <laughs> he couldn't understand why I wanted to be an artist because I had an opportunity in America to be anything, an accountant, a lawyer, something. Uh, I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> and my mother, thank God, was sensible enough to say, listen, if, if he loves it, it's, it's okay. <sighs> but in any event, I was in Europe for four years. I, um, I speak French still. Very well, actually. And I, um, well, uh, oh, I did all sorts of things there. I was in museums all the time. Um, I was in, I had a studio uh, with good light and I was painting. <laughs> if I didn't paint that day, I don't know if I could live in myself. It was like a disease. A healthy or unhealthy guilt-ridden disease, but it kept me working. When I was teaching, uh, 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 20 years later when I was back here, and at the very beginning of it, uh, some of my students said, uh, what does it take to be an artist? And I said, it takes uh, the DDDs. 
The DDDs? Yeah, the three Ds. Desire, determination, and disgust if you don't work at it. And that was defined, that, that, that defined me. <laughs> that, that, that was it. So Europe was wonderful. Uh, it got me away. I was by myself for four years. I was able to sort out uh, what was more me than all the other noise in my head. Um, and um, uh, I had an Italian girlfriend, and we had uh, two velo a moteur. And uh, we would, uh, I'd buy four tickets for me, her, and the two bikes, and we went to Rouen. And we'd get out of Rouen and putt, 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 all. It, it, you went like 12 miles an hour. I mean, you could stop it with your foot. So it wasn't dangerous, and you could daydream. And I'll never forget going up a hill. You know, when you go up a hill, uh, a road, you, you see a straight line, you know, you're going up, and suddenly a monstrous thing was coming up. I, 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 got, I was really frightened. And I got up to the top, and that was the top of Mont Saint-Michel. I didn't realize I was that close to it, and I just saw these, uh, these things. I just painted, drew a lot, um, and I was lonely. I, I, I'm American. Uh, I'm not French. Once uh, Woodstock was 13 years, and there I really get into trees. I get into hiking. I get into mountain streams. I. Uh, I, uh, it changes my life completely from an urbanite to something else. Um, I used to paint in the morning and then hike in the afternoon. Uh, it's four seasons there. Um, uh, snow, I painted a lot of snow scenes. Uh, I, I get involved with uh, mountain streams, rocks, uh, trees, foliage, winter, summer, spring. Uh, I become a landscape painter. Now, I'm used to, as a kid, drawing on sidewalks when I was eight, nine, and looking up and seeing a storefront. You know, I didn't see a, a waterfall or anything. You know, I'm in Brooklyn. So I'm used to um, looking up and seeing things closer to me. And I think I carried that over to the landscape. I, I did a lot of work with portraits. And I tried a few um, commissions, and I did not like them. And, and I like to do portraits of people who I want to paint. So I uh, dropped the commissions, and I kept the portraits of people who I liked to paint. I, I'd uh, ask them to sit for me. I'd pay them. Some of these folks um, had, you know, street kids uh, had no money, and they were thrilled to sit for me. So sometimes I let them borrow the painting for a month and show it to their friends in their own home. <laughs> and then take it back. It was a nice um, give and take thing. And um, uh, in portrait painting, you measure. If you want to get a likeness, you measure. And measuring for me is like automatic. It's not automatic for my students. They don't realize how important uh, measuring could be, even in a landscape, even though, see, in a landscape, you, have, you, don't, you don't have one thing like a head, and, you know, how far are the eyes from the nose. I mean, you know, you have trees, you have this and that, but a certain amount of uh, measuring 
relating, uh, which I bring over from my portrait work and my enjoyment of being up closer to my subject. I don't want just some light and shade on a tree. I want to know the nuances of the tree, the twisting of the tree. It's like a portrait of the tree or the portrait of those rocks. Uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, it's like an outdoor still life, if you wish, with changing lighting conditions. Woodstock did it. Woodstock did it. I became a landscape painter and uh, I started doing something which was not even commonplace then. Uh, by then I was a pastelist and an oil painter, indoors. I decided to take my pastels outdoors, which was practically unheard of except for Wolf Kahn who uh, painted uh, beautiful uh, pastels on location. And he never taught that. Uh, he only taught oils. And when I met him, it was interesting. Uh, I, I meet him many years later in Santa Fe when he had a one-man show. But in any event, uh, I went outdoors with pastels. And, and pastels is an indoor medium. Uh, with oils, uh, you mix a color up and, oh, I, I want it lighter, you make it a little lighter. Oh, I want it darker, you make it a little dark. It's flexible. Pastel is not flexible. There it is. Uh, if you want something darker, you need something darker. It's like, uh, oh, okay. Oils is like the violin. Uh, four or five strings, four or five uh, colors, and, and you can paint a picture. Pastel, four or five uh, pieces of chalk, and you can draw. Yes, you can. You can't paint with that. It's like the piano. So as far as portability goes, would you rather go next door with your violin or your piano? <laughs> violin, no. So... Making pastel portable, that's why I talk about the Heilman box that saved the day. Before that, oh God, I had trouble with it, but I did it. And then I started uh, teaching it in my workshops and I started spreading the the working with pastels on location. I, I Through my workshops, I spread it around and about to the, to the country. Uh, I started that bloody thing. Uh, I'm very proud of that. And I'm very thankful for the Heilman box. Uh, it, it, when I first started in Woodstock, New York, I started teaching pastel and I started teaching it indoors before outdoors. And it was very hard to buy uh, the materials needed. And uh, so I had a, a, a pastel store in my studio. Uh, when the, somebody would say, uh, uh, what should I buy? I, I'd say, just come with what you got. I, I have everything you need. If I had to tell them, go buy this and go buy that, they wouldn't come because they could have, they, it was very hard to even buy pastels back then. Now, now they have conventions. They fly in from <laughs> Australia, France, England. Uh, now it's bingo. Back then it was not bingo. I was in Woodstock, New York from 1970 to 1983. And um, yeah, yep, I was able to open an account and I, I got Rembrandt's. Uh, there was two choices, Rembrandt or Grumbacher, period, that's it. There was no Schmanke, there was uh, no Sennelier, uh, you couldn't find them. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, even with the sanded papers, I was getting into that a lot. Uh, suddenly, 3M, and uh, the other one, I forgot the name, 
suddenly didn't make sanded paper that I was using. So I went down to a, an industrial supply house, which is a huge hardware store, and I went to the back, and they have these little sheets, you know, that they sell. I took some of that home, practiced with it, and they told me I can get special orders. I went back there and I said, I want this in 18 by 24 inches, and I pay a few hundred dollars, and I had my own <laughs> sanded paper. Uh, boy, it's such a different world now. I can't believe it when I stop and think of it. And um, uh, this mixed media thing that I do, uh, I had a pastel where uh, there was an area which I wanted to take out. And back then, I would do it with uh, Gamsol. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, I, I used to do uh, one layer, then wipe it down, and then I'd do another layer and wipe it down. And I just went like this, and the phone rang. I said, ah. So I went and got to the phone and, uh, I don't know, 15, 20, <laughs> whenever it was, I went back and what was underneath that wash looked gorgeous. It like finished the pastel. I said, oh ho. So that opened my eyes to experimentation. It was summer. I liked to hike and I had to paint. If I didn't paint, uh, so I, I had to paint, and then I, I guess I relaxed. And I painted by the mountain streams, because uh, I didn't have the clue about the greens. And uh, uh, after the oil or the pastel was done, I put it in the car, I had my water canteen, I had a little bit of food, and I used to hike along the stream bed. And it's a sunny day, and um, it's, it's becoming the afternoon now, and um, rays of light are coming in on different angles, and I just kept walking for hours. And suddenly it's very orange because the sun is going down. And suddenly the sun is down. And I'm in the woods and it's all green. And I just tasted some purple drifting over it all. And I said, that's it. That's it. In, 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 in bright sun and all that, you don't see this, but underneath it all, uh, there is uh, mauves, cool mauves. There's cool and warm mauves. Uh, uh, purples, mauves. Same word. I uh, finally analyze it. Green is made with yellow and blue. Purple is made with red and blue. Blue uh, is floating around in both colors. Um, you see, if you have green and you have red, you have a contrast, which is nice, which is very nice. That's what they wanted. They wanted a red barn to paint with all these green things. But to modify the green, you don't need red. It's too far away. You need mauves. You need subtle purples at the same value. So uh, when you're applying the thing, uh, pastel or oil, heavily, you're not worried about uh, the textual quality of transparent and opaque, which I am. But let's say you're not. What you want for your greens in order to modify them is to have cool purples or sometimes a warm at the exact same value 
and you can modify the greens. Then you can use the most brilliant greens you have. You see, most of the pastels, uh, they're, they're muted. They're brought up with white instead of yellow. Some companies are better than others. But if you have, I, in my set, I picked out the, the strongest greens I could. And uh, from light, middle tone, dark, warm, cool, you name it. And then I have some purples, cool purples. And they modify the greens so I can use rich greens. Now, the purple is very interesting. It works beautifully with the browns. I mean, what's missing? <laughs> what's missing when you go out in the summer landscape? You have greens and you have, you have browns. Purples, that's, that's to me, that's, that was the key. That was the key. And it was from a long hike enjoying the different angles of sunlight, the different shades of the sun, and all that stuff. And then there was no sun, and I felt like I was in a green womb or something. It was uh, floating. It was just a magical experience. I never forgot it. There's drawing and there's painting. Pastel is a drawing, painting, medium, more so than oils. I'm not too sure why, but uh, I, I know this as a fact. Uh, when I work with oils, it seems to be uh, more extrapolated or more complicated. I'm not too sure what it is, but I know with pastel, it's drawing, painting at simultaneously, more so than, than oils. And it's immediate, it's like your fingertips. And the colors are gorgeous. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I started off with oils. And in oils, you can get resinous um, tones easily. Very hard to pastel. You get resinous tones. And when you work lighter, you got to watch out. It doesn't get too chalky. Too, too, too. That's the expression. With pastel, you work like crazy to get the darks. But the high key colors is never too chalky. They're gorgeous. So one is a matte medium, pastel, where the darks are harder to get and the lighter colors are beautiful. And uh, oils is, is a gloss medium where the resinous darks are much easier to get. And it's... Uh, more delicate when you get higher in key that it doesn't get too too whitish or some too chalky. But I like wet oils at the right time. I love working into the wet. But building the oil so that I can get going with my luscious knife. Uh, application of oils, the base has to be dry. Otherwise, the base is wet and I'm slipping around and I'm not anywhere near where I have to be as far as the, the whole painting goes. So um, I made all sorts of experiments. I, one experiment was to paint the underpainting with acrylics yeah, and you could paint that thicker and, uh, and it dries fast and then I would paint uh, thinner glazing with the oils and blah, 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 blah. And it was uh, two sets of paint and two sets of brushes and I said, oh God, no. And um, so after a lot of experimentation, I worked on chalk grounds, which is very absorbent. Yeah, it's now called clay board. Uh, you know, I go back to where I actually made my uh, <laughs> clay boards uh, or gesso grass. But in any event, you know, things change. So um, uh, I experimented with that. That works very nicely. Uh, but I, the, the textural part of the oils really has grabbed me. You see... 
you got to have some variety. Uh, if you want atmosphere, if you want some space in your landscapes, you 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 have to drop some things, and um, it can't all be the same. And um, uh, slipping it away from opaque, which is wet paint. When 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 I get going with the wet paint, uh, I, I'm thrilled. Uh, but I have to build up to it. And, and, and that wet, juicy paint is oils. It's not pastel at all. <laughs> at all. Uh, the uh, juiciness, uh, well, with the pastel, it's like uh, finger painting. But with, uh, with the oil, it's like, um, it's like swimming. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, if you like wet paint, and I do, at the right time, I just love the oils because there's wet paint. With the pastel, there is no wet paint. Uh, there's drawing and painting more simultaneously, and there is uh, an immediate touch uh, with the chalk. You, you can go lighter, you can go darker. I show that on the, in the DVD. And in oil, you can do that also, but it's, it's hard. You, you got to use different brushes, uh, less, less medium, more medium, you know. But pastel, it's, um, but the oils, I, I like, uh, during the winter months, I like to stay indoors. I don't paint outdoors anymore. It's, you know, I'm 83, a good 83, but I'm 83. I used to stand out there in the freezing cold, <laughs> painting snow scenes and God knows what. I can't do it anymore. But in any event, I like painting indoors. I'm, in, uh, I'm a studio painter and a plein air painter. I do both. And uh, so these days, uh, at my tender age, for the last 10 years or so, I paint uh, it during the winter months. I stay in my studio. Now, let's talk about a studio for a minute. I've had some students say, how do you uh, build? My husband's going to build me a studio. Windows are facing north and go as high as you can go. Uh, you want north light. Um, when you have your fluorescent lights, Make sure they are color-balanced bulbs. And make sure each fluorescent light has its own pull chain. The last thing you want to do is go switch and everything goes up. No. Take your time and individualize it, okay? Uh, each fluorescent light has its own um, pull chain. When I'm standing painting in the winter... Um, I put uh, my light, uh, I'm right-handed, so I have uh, my fluorescent lights on the left side so there's no cast shadow on my surface. You know, I, I see where the brush is going. And I, at 3 o'clock, I put on the lights individually, and I'm painting. And at 5.30, 6 o'clock, you know, it's black outside, I didn't sense a change of the light at all. So, north light, as high as you can get, individual fluorescent lights with individual chains, and uh, the rest is furniture. Uh, all furniture should have wheels. I mean, of course, all furniture should have wheels. I have um, a table, a tabaret. I designed it myself. It has a uh, glass on top of it, a nice thick piece of glass. Underneath it, there's a nice uh, light middle tone gray. It's not white, it's not black, it's gray. And uh, I put my colors always in the same place. Uh, think of the piano. They don't move C sharp all over the place. They, you know, they... 
And for me to put a new paint a color on, a, on, on, on my palette, it's a whole story. Uh, I put it on there and I experiment for months to see if it stays. And I have little ledges going all around my thing. So if I have ultramarine blue here on my palette, I have the tube right there. If I have burnt sienna here, I have the tube right here. So what I want you to do, either from the pastel DVD or the oil DVD, don't expect to maintain or grasp everything. It took me a long time, so it's gonna, this is brand new to you or whatever. Take one part of it, the part that you want to take, that, you see, it, it, desire, there's mindless desire, I want everything, and then there's um, desire that pertains to your inner being. In other words, I want that basically because you understand it. So you want it, okay? So there's arbitrary wanting it, and we forget that. And we take what I'm going to show you, which is so much. You take one part of it that pertains to you. Practice it, please. Practice it technically, and as far as subject goes, try variations of a theme. <clears throat> when you're practicing it, don't worry about, is it finished? Uh, try and get that aspect that's new to you that you can incorporate now, right now, uh, from the DVD. And don't let that slip away. So you don't let it slip away. You don't go changing subject matter. Uh, you, 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 you keep to the subject matter that you're used to. OK? I want you to add on to what you're used to with the oils or the pastel. And you might have to uh, uh, look at these DVDs uh, more than once, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, but if you take something from the DVD and start practicing it, and then you look at the DVD again, and you're able to roll with it, so to speak, and, and grow, that, that's my thoughts. Good luck. Enjoy. God bless you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's the great Albert Handel, a master as far as I'm concerned, and you can learn more about his new video, Painting Greens in Oil, at streamline.art. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section. We also have a free gift for you. It's called 97 Amazing Painting Secrets, and it's yours at 97tips.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. I'm Albert Handel, and uh, welcome to my video. In this video, I will show you how I mix together a transparent underpainting, finishing with uh, opaque oils and having them both come through. Hey, you know, the nice thing about oils is that they're wet. Problem with oils is that they're wet. And I'm going to show you how you can make use of that fact rather than uh, be shot down because of it. No, this is going to be very interesting. I try and cover my canvas at the beginning, thinking of warm and cool, nothing else. And I show that. I take ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. It's, it's interesting. I have found that if I 
complement uh, my greens uh, with a little bit of a burnt sienna, you know, if they're dark. It, it, it uh, makes the greens fuller. It's strange, a little less is more. You just want a little, I call it a zets, a touch, a hit. Uh, there's leaves. Now, when I have contrast, um, this is darker and this is lighter, and they take shapes and all that, rather than noodle them and weaken them, I put something else on top of them. And that's something I've come up with over the years and I've never heard it anywhere else before. When I want to get some green leaves floating over all this, I will go to a, a, a richer green and then by uh, varying the pressure, I look at them as a rhythm. What does that mean? Uh, right here you're going to see some green leaves. Okay, good. What about them? Oh, well they go up to the right and they get lost. Fine, I'll go to a darker green or a colder green and keep going as if the green uh, is an entity in itself. Uh, I call them rhythms or movements. And uh, they tie together contrasting areas without weakening the contrasting areas. See? Uh, I get very excited about these things. And uh, it's going to be a pleasure showing you this.